Hello, and welcome to Fearless Authenticity with Jean Sparrow. This is my podcast about finding your success in the gift of who you truly are. Now, as I've mentioned before, these are conversations with people who know what that looks and feels like, or maybe working their way through it and fine tuning it. I want this to be an inspiration for you to find ways to use your unique gifts in pursuing your passions, making your dreams come true and engaging with the world in the way you were created to serve. It's an exploration for me as well. And I hope it gets deep because that's where we really find good stuff. It's also, however, about the fun of life because if it ain't fun, it ain't worth doing. So let's dare to be brave, be free, be you together. Now, my guest today is an author, award-winning entrepreneur, and inventor who holds several technology patents. He was also named by USA Today as one of the 21 most influential Black people in technology. He is probably best known as the co-founder and CEO of the nation's first theatrical subscription service, MoviePass. He has spent his career in entertainment, working at Motown Records, Sony Music Entertainment, Miramax Films, and he also founded Urban World, the largest international festival dedicated to nurturing filmmakers who are women and Black Indigenous people of color. His new book, Black Founder, The Hidden Power of Being an Outsider, shares the lessons of his journey and it's hot off the presses. I am honored to welcome Stacy Spikes to the Fearless Authenticity Podcast. Hey, Stacy. Hey, Jean. How are you? I am doing wonderfully well even with the uh, trucks in the background. But I'm going to just keep talking to you because my brother, <laughs> I have been reading your book and I'm not finished yet, but I know it's oh. going to be a life changer because you hit us with it in the first chapter. You like, <laughs> I did this. I had this happen. I had this challenge and yeah, I got clean and I'm good. <laughs> All before 20. <laughs> My brother. Well, I, I wanted to make sure it was interesting out the gate. <laughs> and it is. Um, yes. One of the things you talk about, though, right off the top is the transformative power of stories, which is something I think many of us in the industry have in common, whether we're in music, um, you know, journalism, uh, writing, movies or whatever. It's always about the story. How does that play into your life? How does that play into your work? Um, talk to me about stories. Yeah, you know. Ever since I was a little kid, I think many of us have this. We just don't realize how powerful it is. But stories transform my life. And I think from my great grandmother, who we called Mommy, oh. sitting telling us slave stories, you know, and uh, those being embedded in you, and then your grandmother telling you stories. And I think is, as a people, we are really big about passing on our heritage through stories. And if you, every Thanksgiving, y'all remember when Snooky did the Bazin thing? Man, what was wrong with Snooky when that, what was he thinking, right? And there's these stories with people you don't, you never met, but there's these stories about them. And, and you know them. them. You know them and you know they're gonna tell the same. And every Thanksgiving, the story gets a little bit bigger each time. The fish keeps getting bigger <laughs> when the original fish was that big and now it's a whale. Um, but we grew up with storytelling and I talk about it. I don't know if you're at this point in the book, but I talk about how in black culture, black comedians were able to tell jokes, but really talk about the racism we were dealing with in a very, very aggressive, blatant way that would get anybody killed, right? And when you looked at what Red Fox and Leroy and Skillet and Richard Pryor, the way they were talking back to people about the injustices through storytelling, right? And then it's like, oh, well, they're just telling stories. Mm -hmm. um, no, we were telling the truth and biblical stories and stories are transformative. And I think you also write where you're going. So we saw black presidents in Morgan Friedman and Angela Bassett before we had black presidents, right? We wrote them in story. And so 
I think story is everything. Story, story is about where you're going and it's about where you've been. And I love that I, my whole career is I get to represent because I think, sure, people want to be an actor or a director, but who wants to be the bridge builder that makes it easier for the audience and the storyteller to meet? And that's my role in the world. I make sure that black and brown and women's stories get told, you know, and seen. I love all of this so much and how and how your path has gotten to it. I'm not going to ruin any of the book for people. I'm going to just try to pull out the pieces so that they can enjoy it in the way that I have been enjoying it. And yes, the comedian spot um, uh, strikes a, pr a particular chord for me because I've worked with so many of them and they very and black comedians, especially, I think, are very um, religious and yes. committed to how they carry the torch and realizing where it comes from. I mean, I, I think we saw that, you know, when Eddie Murphy made Dolomite, you know, yeah. and, and was committed to that because that is a tradition that has allowed them to become these newer truth, truth tellers. But your story to me in and of itself is a transformation. When you talk about packing up your truck from Houston and going out to Hollywood with $300 and how your parents, like literally our parents and our parents being, my mother went to Southern, your parents yes. went to Gramlin. And yeah. I, I know that HBCU parent look. <laughs> Um, but talk to me though, about how you made the decisions you did. Um, because, you know, I think it's a lot of times we can, we can, you know, talk about having a vision in hindsight, right? Because yeah. hindsight is 2020 and we can see how it came into place. But what I'm interested in is helping people find their way through other people's stories. So what, how did that vision come about internally for you? Did you always know what you were meant to do or were those parental expectations of those first gen college educated folks yeah. who worked three jobs and yeah. were like, we, we, we doing this for you. You better do something with this. Um, yes. You know, how do, how did all of that get balanced to become this vision for you, Stacy. You know, <clears throat> going, I think going out to LA with my $300 was a complete act of insanity. Um, now that I have a daughter who's a year and a half out from college, if she, if next year she says I have $300 and I'm going to LA, I don't think I'm going to have the calm reaction. My dad, you know what my dad was like, he's going to make it to Albuquerque and end up turning around and coming back. And my mom was kind of like, honey, follow your dreams. But I think because her, one of her brothers was out in LA, I think secretly she was like, he'll be back. <laughs> I think they just really believed I, I wasn't going to get very far, but they raised a very tenacious child. And, um, but I think it, it, there, the beginning, there was no master plan, but there was always the, there are, you came from a people who were slaves. Your grandmothers sewed curtains and washed clothes their whole life. Their parents worked sugarcane fields. And your direct parents were the first ones to be allowed to read and get an education don't fuck this up. I, I'm sorry. This is a family no. show, but mm -mm. Um, but but Tell it the was there, there's a there's a sense of responsibility, and I think people have asked me. The subtitle is you know black founder, the hidden power of being an outsider. Well, what is an outsider? Outsider is if you don't have ownership. If you don't own, you are an outsider. You are a you're working there uh you're you're supporting wherever you are you can they could love you you could be get bonuses but let there be a downturn in the economy and you are six months or less away from a very stressful time in your life and but ownership changes everything where if you can get a business to generate income on your behalf 
you can go sit on a beach and it'll make money, right? And you can pay somebody to manage the store. And that was the thing where my grandparents and their parents were like, why did they fight for 40 acres and a mule? Because it was, I need to own things that can increase value. And that, that, that to me has been a underpinning. And I talk about it in the Motown chapter where, you know, Gerald Busby tells me, don't stay at a company if you, more than four years if you don't own stock in it, you know. Or, or Barry Gordy making a decision that anyone who is CEO of Motown has to be a person of color, writing that in the bylaws going forward because ownership is important. So that, that, that driving factor was whether I ran a grocery store or I w- became an actor, a musician, or do what I do today, I think ownership was the thing that go to college, don't go to college, but boy, you better own something. I you know. love so much of that and how, you know, it's funny how our parents' advice sometimes or what they've taught us sometimes runs counter to their advice because it's yeah. like I had a similar conversation with my parents, especially my mother, because my dad was a little more like your mom, like, okay, baby, go ahead on. As long as somebody's there to have your back. And I had a lot of family in Chicago. So yeah. I, that was why it was okay for me to go to Chicago and not go to New York. Um, so I'm, I'm laughing at those similarities, but also what they taught us by what they do and who they yeah. are. It's interesting how we tease out those lessons from yeah. what they teach us. Right. Um, and 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 how, you know, we, we make those discoveries on our own of what mm-hmm. those lessons actually are. Was there a turning point for you? Like you've done a lot of things and tried out a lot of things. You've been on, you've been on auditions as an actor, musician, um, working in, uh, in, in distribution of videos and, uh, and learning lessons all along the way. Have there been turning moments in each of those, uh, especially given some of this advice that you've gotten, you know, later in your career, have there been turning moments where you've gone, okay, this isn't right for me. This isn't part of the vision anymore, or it never was. And it's time for me to shift. Or is that just something that you uh, have a system of working your way through? That's a great question. Um, I still think the light on the hill was ownership. Okay. And the, the lighthouse was, no matter how much I was making and no matter how big I was and no matter what red carpet premieres and I'm representing boys to men and I'm doing all of this big stuff, I still was a paycheck away. I still was... Somebody, I, I could go into a boss and that boss is having a bad day and I say the wrong thing and I'm out. And especially I in the music business. The especially in music, music and movies. Crazy. Baby. Crazy. <laughs> crazy. So there was never a sense of security. And, I'm, and all I kept thinking, there's a saying, and I don't remember where it came from, but this person across from me no matter who they are and how big they are, they still put their pants on one leg at a time. And they didn't have some master plan. And therefore, if they don't have all that, then maybe I got at least some of the same goods they got. I got common sense. I can add, I got a calculator. I can do, you know, I brought in, $20 $20 this month and I spent 10. Okay, I'm ahead. And so I, I think it kept going back to you don't own. And all the way up through me being at Miramax, you don't own. It was just this haunting feeling of you were always on eggshells. And, and I don't, some people don't ever want to start a business. They don't ever have that calling of, I don't want to be the boss. I like getting my paycheck. I, you know what? I'll go find, you know, find another job if I get. They don't want to sit in the corner office. 
me, I sleep better in the corner office than I do in an office that I know I have no control. I'd rather fail on my own than wait to get fired by somebody else. Baby, that, that is a quotable moment. Because, because you know what though? I do think that that is what separates entrepreneurs from not, and look, this is no judgment on it because it takes all kinds yeah. to run the world and all of us have different sorts of capacity when it comes to that. I do think that when we get into entrepre being entrepreneurs, we don't always realize everything that's in involved right. in what ownership means. But it is, it, it's interesting how there's this clarion call that you yeah. keep working toward because you're like, there's, there's got to be something more for me. And I think we all hear that in different ways. Now, I want to mm -hmm. shift to movie pass because I think this is a perfect yeah. encapsulation of what it is you're talking about and what you put on the line for it. So, I mean, you basically went from the from the frying pan right into the fire. Um, because yeah. when we talk about, you know, when we talk about technology, like Arlen yeah. Hamilton is is pounding this into people's heads in, in yeah. a very real and visceral way. Only 1% of venture capital funding, especially at the time that you were, you would have found at MoviePass was going to black entrepreneurs. Um, yeah. And then you get to the success of having a private equity firm, you know, invest in the company but then you get kicked out because you like what you're doing is not going to work, fam. And then you have to sit there and watch as they run your company into the ground, drive it into bankruptcy and dismantle it. And you could have stopped it if they had listened. That yes. had to be heartbreaking on so many different levels. You talk about being an outsider and here you are an outsider, even when you have ownership. Yeah. Talk to me about how you got through that, because the emotional impact of putting all that work into a company had to be something else. Um, getting ousted out of something that yeah. you owned had to that would have brought back generational trauma for me. Yeah. Um, uh, how do I encapsulate this into a question? What about being an outsider did you learn even better from that situation? And how did you come to see it as a power? This is going to sound crazy. I knew I was Black. I was proud that I was Black. But at that moment, I got reminded that I'm Black. And in that way that you thought you had climbed above the clouds. You smack into the ceiling. I had grossed nearly $3 billion. I, 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 I had represented Boys to Men, Queen Latifah, Eddie Murphy, Spike Lee, Stevie Wonder. I did the Bad Boys soundtrack. I, I did Scream, I did Crow, I did Train Spotting. I, I was a vice president at Miramax. It's like, I was one of the hot, you've seen USA Today calls you this, you're this and this. And then you're out in the world where you're raising capital. I'm, I'm one of the 1%, but now I'm gonna stand there and be one of the ones that I watch 99% of people less qualified than me achieve things and get access to capital. And this is where there's a whole section in the book that maybe one day will get posted online that we took out. I realized in the VC world that there's still a level of an apartheid system. Because when you think about it, there are these funds that after George Floyd said, let's create a diversity fund. And they all put around 10% aside. Well, if they all put 10% aside, that should mean that the number went from 1% to 10%, right? No. But it didn't. So what happened was they created drinking fountains and said, Here's a drinking fountain. 
Because remember, they're taking money out of a fund. They're taking from the, the big drinking fountain and they're making a small drinking fountain and saying now more people will be able to drink because we've set this money aside. And notice the amount of people who got to drink didn't increase. And that was the first time I realized I was living inside of a system, a construct that I never re because I, I got I and the guys who took over raised a quarter of a billion dollars within 90 days from buying the company from two black founders, the same company. And we could we raised 20 million dollars. And they went through four hundred million dollars in less than 12 months. And so just. If you gave me a quarter of a billion dollars, that company, the company was valued at half a billion dollars off of two black founders who only raised $10 million. And to lose that, what I'm talking is change and generational wealth. And to be able, that's when I went back and I read Sammy Davis and I read you know, Malcolm, and I read Muhammad Ali, and I read all of those stories where in the 50s and 60s, how those black entertainers and athletes lost everything. And I was like, wow, I am a successful businessman with a proven track record of success. And I'm experiencing something that is astounding. And I'm, I'm in a boardroom telling all white people, all white men, you can't make that plane fly at $10 a month. And they're like, you're crazy. You're just an upset founder. You need to go. And they fired me via an email. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. January 9th, I got an email that says, thank you, your services are no longer needed. Your position in the company has been removed. Uh, we appreciate Stacey. all your service. It's in the book. Stacy, I haven't gotten to that chapter yet. I stand, I, I, brother, brother. Email, I got. Okay, and, I and can't it, wait it, to it keep. Did say, it did say, we're sorry we can't be there to do this in person. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's how, so, that's, yeah. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack in this. And um, as the kids say, um, because it does speak to the endurance of the systems that are set up and how expanding the boundaries of those systems actually does not work. I, I had never thought of the 10% funds that, that you know, people were doing in the terms that you just put them. But I think we experience that in a lot of different ways. We see it you know, playing out in police reform. We see it playing out in a lot of different ways where it's like, oh, how do we fix what's there? And all we're doing is recreating looser systems of the same restrictions, right? Mm -hmm. People can get higher and do more, but there's still not an equity in, involved in it. Um, once you realized what you were up against, once you realized that you knew what your success was and you could, you could create that again, what did that then become for you? Like what, what, how, how does, how did, mm -hmm that crystallize a different layer of outsiderness that maybe you, it doesn't sound like you had even in, uh, it considered at that point. Yeah, um, so you're talking about after buying it back, like coming back after, after well, that? Well, what I wanna know is, is that the, the piece in between because you couldn't have known at that moment that you would have an opportunity when this company no, was in bankruptcy no. to, to right. buy it and relaunch it the way you are now. So I want to talk no. about, because to me, you know, there's a book out that says life is in the transitions. Mm -hmm. 
Oh. And I, I, I firmly believe that we spend a lot of our time in transition, but looking at what's after the transition, but what yeah. you do inside that transition, no yeah. matter what your awareness of it is, yeah. that's what counts. So that's yeah. what I want to know about with this, because yours is such an extreme case. Like, it's like, yeah. okay, yeah. what was in your head <laughs> after you get that fucked up email <laughs> and, and, and your dream and your, what you've worked your whole entire career yeah. to this yeah. culminating event, yeah. Of all this money you made for other people, all this money you should be making for yourself and your funders. Yeah. And now you out and you like, mm, right. that's not going to work the way y'all, that's not the flex you think it is, but okay. What happens between then and buying it back? Yeah. This is a weird journey. You know, it's the, the footprints in the sand you get carried in a way that you don't realize. <clears throat> and I talk a little bit about this in the book. And like grief, you go through these stages. First, you feel sorry for yourself and somehow you feel to blame. Should I have gone down the path with these guys? Could I have prevented it? Should I have done something different? What if I had done this? Hey, you know that investor that was offering me 10 million? Maybe I should have done that. You know, that, you know. You go through that. It was my fault. I should have done something different. And then you go from feeling sorry for yourself to getting angry. And there's two things that people do with that anger. They either turn it on themselves and the loved ones around them, or you pour it back into the work. And I don't remember maybe a week I felt I would, my wife at one point said, you need to go get an office and get out of the house. She just was like, she kicked you, you out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. I get kicked out of my company and then my wife is kicking me out of the house. And so she's like, you, you need to go someplace. And um, so I went and rented an office and here's the crazy thing. I called up WeWork and the, the company where I was had moved out. I knew they had moved out and moved uptown when they got bought. And I called and I said, do you guys have any offices? They said, well, actually we have one office and it's your old office. Yes. <laughs> no. They said, we have literally, it, and it's a, it was like this two-person office. So it's a small office. And they said, we have one office available in the whole building, and it's your old office. And I said, I'll be right over. And I signed the paperwork. And then I, and two weeks later, maybe two, three weeks later, whatever it is, I moved into my old office that I built Movie Pass in. Okay, that's the first thing. That was one of those... Hmm. The hairs it's, on my arms and the back of my neck it are is gonna get straight better. up. It's God gonna get be better. moving, baby. Moving. It's gonna, it's okay. gonna get better. Then I am sitting in my office and there's a line, and I talk about it in the book where and you talk about stories. And there's a line when Moses has Pharaoh behind him and he goes to the edge of the water and he's got all the people sitting there looking at him like, yo, you just got us out here and Pharaoh's coming with his people and we're all dead. We can't go across the sea and we can't go backwards. And they're stuck in this valley. And Moses takes time and he goes to the water and he says to God, do something. And it's very interesting. We think of the Charleston Heston version in the movie where he takes a staff and it parts, but it's, they, don't, they don't say this, but what, what he says in the Bible, that he says to God, help me. And God says, why are you crying to me? I gave you everything you need part the sea yourself. Go read it. So I'm sitting in my office and I'm kind of feeling a little confused. And that story 
Why are you crying to me? They didn't take your brain. They didn't take your knowledge. They didn't take your passion. You got left with everything you had to build everything you built. So why are you crying to me? Go build it again. And it, it, I was sitting in that office and it was like, why, is, why am I sitting here thinking of the Moses story? And I went back home and we have, you know, the, the black family Bible that gets passed down to the oldest the child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I went back home and I reread that section in the Bible that night. And I was like, he gave me everything I need. I will be given everything I need. I will rebuild. I will rebuild. He put me back in my old office. I will rebuild. And that was the, that was the moment everything fell away. And that was it. It was like, okay, we'll figure it out. Stacy. <laughs> okay, let me let me just tell you. Let me also give me add another layer of how God works for, in, in this. Something my therapist told me um, when I was going through a challenge and you know still working through it and everything. She said to me, "Everything you need, you already have." have. Yeah. And it's something that I repeat all the time. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting how. And this is something I've talked to other guests on the pod about and other friends as well that at the moment when you know you've been taught like these things are back there, mm -hmm. sometimes when we are challenged, we forget those things. And then right. somehow we're brought back very viscerally in the moment to that. And that's what this sounds like uh, yeah. to me. So after, as you rebuild and, mm -hmm. and now you have gotten the opportunity to buy back movie pass, yeah. um, I have, I have two questions. The first one is, how do you feel about second chapters now? You know, second I think- Second chances when, or second uh, yeah, chances. I, 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 think, I think America is a very unique place because we have so many people who rebuilt. When you think of the Steve Jobs story, I went, I spent a lot of time during that time going back and reading biographies and autobiographies, and there's not a single one of them that said, I woke up, I had a great idea, I went to the bank, they gave me money, I was a success, and I never failed. I didn't read that anywhere. They all had peaks and valleys and peaks and valleys, and at the highest points, they all fell. And the, the ones we write in, Henry Ford completely crashed and burned Ford One. Complete crashed and burned. How do you get up from that and go do it again? Donald Trump filed for bankruptcy seven times, becomes the president. I, I say to people all the time, be dumb enough to get out of your own way. Like sometimes we're so smart thinking about what we think people are gonna think about us. Worried about that. Because the people who aren't gonna like you aren't gonna like you anyway. <laughs> so It don't matter it, what you do. In fact, they'll the, hate you more. The, yes, the, the better you do, they're gonna, oh, he ain't shit. He, right? It's. Yeah, well, you know what? His daddy gave him some money. His his great grandpa left him something. He didn't he didn't build that on his own. It's 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 like they're not gonna like you anyway. And so many people, I watched them stop. Well, what if I fail? What does that mean to fail? There is no such thing as failure. It's just learning. And if you learned about what didn't work, guess what? Next time you're gonna do it differently, which means there's a lower probability of you doing that again. So. I, I, I think that second chances are the whole, as an entrepreneur, what I think about is this building that I'm in, this chair that I'm sitting at, at this table and this computer I'm on, everything I look at was an idea in someone's mind. And see, they all failed on the way they had they couldn't make money. They People said it was stupid. They said Albert Einstein was in the uh, trademark office 
he had a very good job and people said, what are you talking about planets and stars and wave particles and shut up. His first paper, they laughed at him. So everything you see, people, there's that, you know, the saying, um, most people are, most people who say something can't be done is being interrupted by someone doing it. It's, it's like that. And so if you think everything in your world, somebody told that person they can't do that and it's not going to work, then you see how prevalent perseverance must be in order for things to exist. Because they just don't happen on the first try. Uh, and then I will go on to your next question. I got the pleasure one day of meeting Ben from Ben and Jerry's. And I hear he's I, such a good dude. I was at Sony and they had sold the company but kept certain rights. And he was looking at making an amusement park that was going to be an ice cream amusement park. And he wanted to know if Sony was interested in, in possibly coming in. So I got to be a fly on the wall and I'm sitting in this meeting. And so Ben, everybody's going to take a bathroom break. We've been in this meeting for hours. And I said, Ben, can I ask you a question? He says, sure. I said, so what did you learn between, you know, after doing Ben and Jerry? If you said one thing that you want everybody to know, he said, first, you have to build it wrong to build it right. And he says, the first, we failed at the first Ben and Jerry's because they told us that you need to whip the ice cream very high and then you put the nuts or whatever, just at the top. You can't make money where you crumble an entire uh, chocolate bar and put it in there because it's just not cost effective. You can't do that. So what they did was investors talked them out of and they went with the first version and they went bankrupt. And it was another name of another ice cream company. And Ben and Jerry said we were two fat guys from Vermont and we wanted real ice cream. And we were, if we were going to go broke, we were going to make ice cream for people like us who wanted every scoop was going to have whatever, Rocky Road or whatever was in it. And he said we became a success because we ignored everything everybody in the ice cream business said you shouldn't do. You know, and they had to build it wrong in order to do it right. And that doesn't mean he failed. That was a learning part of the pathway to building one of the greatest ice cream companies ever created. You know, you know what's interesting about this whole story and, and the thing about it, it's about what you pay attention to and what you don't and what the essence of it is, like what's underneath all these lessons, reading those biographies, because I have a feeling your book is going to be right there with all those other ones in this up and down peaks and valleys, because I'll tell you the biggest, and the reason why I say this is because, and I think it's also, as much as we love, <clears throat> excuse me, as much as we love second chances as Americans, as much as we love uh, triumph stories from from you know perseverance and failure, uh, supposed failure. We also hate failure. Yes. We also are taught that we have to overcome these failures, and that failure is a bad thing. Yeah. The best advice I got when I first started my business was, "You are going to fail every day." Yeah. <laughs> Get used to it. Learn from it. Learn to like the word no. <laughs> <clears throat> and I already knew the word no yeah. because I'm, I, I come from radio and television. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you know, the entertainment business is good for a hard no quick. Yeah. Yeah. But it was hard for me. Yeah. I remember the first six months. Of, mm. of working on my own after my show got canceled mm. and I'd had this idea for a business and I, I basically got pushed into it because God was like, I keep up with these windows. Yeah. You keep having <laughs> these, you know, thing. And one of my advisors was like, God opened a door and pushed you through it because yeah. you were never going to leave until they, until they did something. Right. That's but, right. but 
I felt like a failure every day and I hated it. I hated it. I'm used to winning. I'm used to making money I'm, for people and for myself. I'm used to being part of a team. Let me tell you something. I had to do a lot of soul searching. Yeah. And I remember one of the things I gave myself was one win a week. I was like, if I can just have uh, one win a week, yeah. I can yeah. get through all these other failures and all this other learning because it's humbling as an adult yeah. to um, go to get to that point. So I, yeah. even though I don't know it to the financial level yeah. and the epicness of watching yeah. something you work so like I, I, Mm, I know, I know some of that feeling, right? That frustration. Yeah. And I think, I think I would have fought somebody like physically fought somebody oh, had yeah. I been you. Oh, See, yeah. God, oh, God gives oh. us certain things only because yeah. he knows how we can handle them. Because if I handle some things, it's prison. It's prison, Stacy. <laughs> you a better man than I am a woman. I'll tell you that. I, I, you know, I couldn't find them when I was walking <laughs> the streets of New York. I, it, it That's why they uh, emailed uh, you. Uh, <laughs> you think that they were going to stand in a room and say that stuff to me to my face? They were very smart, very smart people. They were and like, they also protected you. They were like, let's email this brother because we just don't know <laughs> if, he, if his eye starts twitching or something. Like, it's make pop sure off in company. In <laughs> you know, they got two big bouncers, and, <laughs> and we just wanted to let you know, you know. <laughs> Throw, throw my throw the letter at me or something you know you you said something that i think the process b smith had this saying you have to stand on a mountain of no's in order to reach the yes and i think if you if every no isn't a no it's actually sharpening the blade and and when you when you look at so I, 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 I like shaving with straight razors. And when you're honing a razor. Okay, mister. <laughs> hey, when you're, when you're honing those razors and you look at how the Germans and the Japanese, all of these people were separate. And yet they, when the metal age came, shaving and cutting you know, your hair and grooming developed in different parts of the world. They all had to hone the steel in a certain way. God does that with us because there's enough, and, and I'm, I'm sorry I'm going to the book, but. Don't, don't, it, be, no, it, it, don't apologize, it, please. No, I know, but it, it's, but, you know, how many times do they say if you, you know, if you, you will spoil the child, the child, if you waste the rod, but there's this great line where they say God disciplines those he loves and discipline is learning to override my feelings, what I want, what I need, what I believe is mine, right? It's, it's teaching you to move through the water efficiently without thought or effort. And you don't, you don't just, you're not born that way. You have, you watch the swimmer, you watch a human being who is a very good swimmer cut through the water. They're not a fish, but yet when you look at them, they've learned to use their body and go through water. And they, they didn't just wake up and go do that the pain and the, the effort it took to learn how to use the water in a way, you know, when they, they train the um, Navy SEALs and the Marines, they will tie their hands behind their back, tie their feet and throw them in a 20 foot pool and say, get out. And they say, why are we tough on you? Because when you're behind enemy lines and we can't come and get you, you need to be able to save yourself. And that's what God did to me when he taught me about failure and gave me biblical passages that I could sit in that office and say, oh, you know what? You were 19 and ended up in a detox. You were this age and they stole your equipment. You were that age and this happened. Get up. It's not, it's, what, what is that? It's, it's just mental for you. It's just, there's nothing, 
Nobody hurt you. You didn't get shot. Like, get up. Go build something else. And that, to me, is preparedness, not failure. And see, we mistaken what he's doing for you. And if even if I didn't make it, my children or people who read this book are going to have a mental preparedness that I'm handing to them because I read Malcolm X's book. You know, I read, you know, Muhammad Ali's book. They gave me those things that helped me get up off that canvas. When Muhammad Ali was walking into a stadium after his two best friends, Malcolm X and, and uh, Martin Luther King, were killed, and people are saying, Negro, you're next. Why is he to believe that that's not going to happen to him? He just watched to very, they were more famous than him at that time. Because he was still becoming, you know, leaving Cassius Clay, becoming, you know, and, and yet these men were taken out. And there he goes saying, my job is still to feed my family and go walk in there and defy these people. And that was courage to me. Me getting up and trying to rebuild a company, nobody's putting death threats on me. And so I had great courage from what they wrote down. You might think my book is courage. I'm like, nobody was trying to kill me. I didn't have it hard. So their knowledge and them writing, the, and back to your first part of this, was their stories helped me walk through what I went through. It was like they were in the room with me. I had the good book in the room with me. I had Steve Jobs in the room with me. I had Malcolm in the room with me. I had Muhammad in the room with me. I had read Obama's book and he's in the room with me. What am I, what am I worried about? Get up, get, get back to work. Who cares? This is your this is your task. Go make change. Make it happen. So that's that's how I feel. I I love that as a strategy of overcoming things because I think we all find our or I hope we all find our way to it because I think that if we don't find our way to that strategy of failing forward, of learning, of being prepared and, and shifting how we look at what we perceive to be our failures, then that means that person's purpose actually doesn't ever happen because yeah. they don't see those folks in the room with them, whether it's their own ancestors or our collective ancestors. Um, <clears throat> you have also had the uh, blessing of some amazing people in your career. You mentioned Gerald Busby, uh, Clarence Avant, Oscar yeah. Fields, you know, all yeah. these people. And, and I haven't even gotten to all of the, the rest of them in the book because you shouting folks out yeah. and talking about these intimate things that you learned from them. What do you think, Stacy, is the best piece of advice you got from any of them that has stuck with you throughout? You talk about uh, also even people that we don't, maybe haven't heard of that mm. first boss who you picked up uh Hebrew working in his oh, office William. and like yeah, yeah, and William yeah, yeah. and got and yeah. and finally got the nerve to ask for a raise and in, and made sure you did it yeah you made sure you did it in the way he heard you um and it sounded like he respected that yes um, but yes. we all have people like that like there was a receptionist at my first job yeah. who was like listen girl she when she would go outside on, on her cigarette break she would be like come here come here and while she was smoking she would be standing there and so now like, listen listen tell it, tell it let me, me tell yeah. you listen this is the one you need this is what you need to watch out for because you be trusting yes. everybody yeah <laughs> and then tell the rest it's always people like that that tell yes. you things that stick with yeah. you so yeah. given all these folks that have made appearances yeah. in your book yeah. um what are some essential pieces of advice that you you carry with you it's all the same they all they say it in their own way. They give it to you different ways. They get some. Some will give you a goal why you should do it, but it's always the same. Never give up. It's always the same. Can you imagine? Let's let's. There's you talk about story, 
And I believe as you live your life, Benjamin Franklin said, either do something worth uh, reading about or write something that people will want to read. And what he was trying to say is either live your life in a way that people will want to write about you, or if not, write something down that people will find interesting. Either way, they're the same thing. And I think you don't know it, but you're writing your story. And your family's going to retell that story. Your friends are going to retell those stories. And they, they're going to become a part of a DNA, a fabric going forward of a people. And I've been blessed to get to a certain level at this space and time. I could have been, I could have been a Negro pitcher who got to play in the major leagues. I could have been... I could have been Sammy, I could have been whatever. What happened if the story went, they sent him an email, they fired him, they ran his company in the ground, he became a drunk and died penniless, penniless and homeless. I was like, that ain't happening on my watch. That's not the story. The story, if no one gives me anything, that dude was 95 and still starting businesses. He never gave up. He just wouldn't quit. The best compliment I ever heard from a uh, theater owner, he said, dude, you're like Rasputin. You just won't die. I, that is the best compliment someone has ever given me. <laughs> he said, they poison you, they shoot you, they stab you. He's like, you're the zombie, the night of the living dead. He goes, you just don't die. I'm, I want to be that action movie. Like, you're RoboCop. You know, Remember RoboCop? Yes. <laughs> yes. Just limping through Detroit. Yes. It's like, what do you want the story to be about you? And, and it's all a form of perseverance. And I think the perseverance goes back to the love of the people who helped me be where I am and the love of the people who are going to follow me, that I can lead an example that is going to make some people courageous and say, they just fired me too. I'm getting up. I, I got that courage from Steve Jobs' book. I, I read I read his story, you know, and th those people who felt I all of those people I name all of those biographies read their story. You're never gonna read any of them that didn't get sucker punched. People took their little money, stole their business, kicked them in the back, pushed them down the hill. You know, we'll take it from here. Everybody, it happens to us all. Well, you better be ready for it. And when they come and they throw dirt in your eye and they cheat, it's okay. You will knew it was coming. And you'll be like, oh, yeah, I knew that was coming. But it's all about getting up off the canvas. And that's why uh, I think it's in the front of the book. It is. Um, Fall I down seven times. Seven times. Stand up eight. That's all there is. That's what everybody says in some way. It's not, no one ever said, when they hit you, just lay down and play dead. I, I, I haven't had anybody tell me that yet. That some of them say, okay, don't go to their house with gasoline and matches, but, right? <laughs> like, I want to talk. <laughs> don't I, show I, like, up I have a few things I'd like to discuss. <laughs> remember, remember waiting to exhale? <laughs> She was like, <laughs> it's like, you know, so, but, but, but the thing they all say is never quit, never, never quit. Don't give up because you don't know the miracle can be just around the bend right there. I remember I had a moment like that 
I, during the pandemic, when all my clients, like it was going to be my best, 2020 was going to be my best year. Stacy, it's going to be my best year. It's going to be my best year. All of my clients, the pandemic happens, all of my clients canceled. And I, I, I couldn't say no, because I'm like, what would I actually do with them, right? But here's the thing that's crazy. 2020 was still my best year because I even talked to my advisor and was like yeah. I'm gonna have to go get me a job he was like hold up wait yeah. a minute yeah. we've saved money for this yeah. we can ride this out everybody in the same boat G everybody's like, in the same boat. he was like yeah. and this is why financial job like, was, right he was <laughs> like first of all he was like yeah. we go he said you'll never hear me say this again make the minimum payments on your credit cards yes. do what you gotta do we'll figure it out do all of these things but he was just like hold up <laughs> Yeah. Hold up. This yeah. is not the yeah. end of things. Yes. And quite literally that year was the best year of my business there and everything. And it was this close, Stacey. And I was yeah. ready to throw it all in and yeah. get a job. How I didn't know. I don't even know how I thought I was going to get a job, yeah. Yeah. but yeah. it's, it is fascinating to me how many stories I hear like that. And, you know, another thing I like to say is it's so simple, but it's not easy but it is simple. It's deceptively, yeah. it's yeah. deceptively, um, it draws you in because you're like, oh, that's great advice. Never quit. But yeah. it's, it, oh, it's not easy to do. No, no. The other one I think is when you said it's simple, the best advice I heard was when you don't know what to do, do nothing. And we think when I don't know what to do, do something. Panic. I got it, I got it, I got it. Call everybody. I, I have to do. But if you chill out and give it a moment, just a moment, just wait. Take the weekend. It's, it's Friday night. You're not going to get anything done between now and Sunday. Like, take the weekend off. Go to a movie. I don't have any money. You got $22 in the bank. Go to a movie, right? Something happens in what did Martin Luther King said? Faith is a staircase where you know that stairs lead up, but you don't know, you cannot see them. Yeah. Something like that. So I'm bad at saying Stacy. So, but yeah, I know what but, you're but, talking but, about, but it's like where you can't yeah, see you, where they're going. Right. And, and so a spiral staircase where faith is a spiral staircase where you cannot see the stairs at the top. And, mm -hmm. and it's like that. You keep walking. It's going to be okay. You know, but just keep going. It's, and there's another saying I love. It's not, it's not the water that kills swimmers. It's panic. You know, it's, oh no, I, I can't make it. I'm going to write that gets you in more trouble than the water, right? The water right. is not the problem. Stay calm. You know, they tell you if you're getting tired, turn over on your back, you know, and then roll back over and make sure the nice, slow strokes, right? They give you these things. Why? Because they're trying to explain it's not the water and you can get through this. You can go vast distance. Women are women and men are swimming the entire English channel. You can make it to that that 50 yards, you know? <laughs> there there and and there is a piece in that stillness that you and that really is an exercise in faith. Uh my dad used to say, he was like, uh sometimes you gotta be like a buzzard sitting on a fence, can't kill nothing, waiting for something to die. You just sit that there. Is you great. just sit there. Right. And, and I did not understand what that meant fully yeah. until yeah. I until I was an entrepreneur and sitting there going, I ain't got no business. What the yeah. hell am I going to yeah. do? And couldn't do yeah. nothing because everybody was stuck in their houses for the pandemic. Yes. yes. Lord yeah. have mercy. Stacy. I could talk to you forever. <laughs> I am so proud of you and grateful to you for making Same. taking Thank the you. moment for this and for writing your book, because I think those of us who uh, have visions of whatever it is we want to do, do need more stories. And we also need stories from the people who look like us um, yes. to tell us those things. So thank you for that. 
uh, Black Founder, The Hidden Power of Being an Outsider. I cannot wait to finish it. I do have one last question that I always yes. ask every yes. single one of my uh, podcast guests. And that yes. is, um, because this is about fearless authenticity, which you have exhibited throughout this. When do you feel like you are at your best, truest, most authentic expression of you? The first answer that comes is when I'm working, but I'm trying to think if there's something deeper than that. It you doesn't have it to be deep. Go ahead. You know, you know, I think it's there's this new term and in, in some of the stuff we talked about before we joined, but you've heard the term flow. Yes. When they talk about working and flow, whenever you're doing something when you let go of the results, you release the expectations, but yet you are going to give it everything. It can be the dishes. It can be your relationship. It can be camping, running, swimming, working. When you, when you let that happen, you tap into flow. And if you ever go look at some, some YouTube videos about it, I, ne I never understood what they were talking about, but when you hit flow, space and time literally changes. I can be working on something and my wife will call and go, honey, you said you were coming home four hours ago. And I'll be like, wow. Or, or I can be running and I'll go, huh, I'll just keep going. And I'm listening to a podcast. Next thing I know, oh, I just did five miles and I don't even remember doing it. That there's something amazing in there when you can fall into flow and you you're just you're it, it's the perfect word you're you're right there with the universe and if I think oh I gotta go run three miles dang, God damn it I hate that you know it's a struggle but when I just release it and I lean into it everything becomes easier because I think we get caught up in the victimhood and what I don't have and what I didn't get and I lost and they got mine and I'm not going to get and I want, Jim's got a big brand new car. I need a new car. Once you let all of that go and you are in the beauty of the now, there's no problems. Everything's okay. It's so zen and, it, and it's true. That is something I have been... Uh, discovering and working on myself. It's when you are in flow, it is a beautiful thing, but the, it is the letting go. Yeah. While it sounds so simple, it's, it's challenging. It is not easy because we do accumulate things and we yeah. don't want to, you know, put down that steamer trunk of yeah. stuff that we've been carrying with us and we have to face it to be able to let it go. And that's where the little rub is. And that yeah. could take us into a whole other conversation. Stacy. Um, I'm gonna have to have you back on the pod because yes. you are you are a gentleman and a scholar and quite wise. Quite, ah, quite wise. Well, thank you, Jean. Thank you. I, I, I look you. forward to meeting you in person and I can't wait to hear what you think when you finish the rest of it. Oh, I'm straight up reaching out when I'm done because I have a feeling it's going to set my hair on fire. Um, but just from, from what I have read, and then I was like, but wait, let me skip forward and see. And then I'm looking and going, oh, wait, hold up. What else happened? And then I was like, wait, I got to go back and start over again now because I missed something. Wait, he said what? <laughs> I'm so chaotic, Stacey. I, am I love so it. Chaotic. I love but it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I am so grateful for that conversation, Stacy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It felt like a masterclass. So you know the book is gonna be one as well. So here are some things though uh, that I took from our conversation, even though there were so many things I'd love to list right now. But the first one is about how we look at failure um, and a few different things under that, how every no isn't a no and that all that part is doing, those no's are doing is sharpening the blade. The idea that 
each failure is a preparation, a preparedness for whatever it is that you're really supposed to be doing, which brings to mind for me that the word failure has so much emotional content to it that we've needed to interpret it in a different way for us to see how it's necessary in our lives and what its function actually is. Um, the importance of that story and Stacy's interpretation of that Benjamin Franklin quote that as you live your life, either do something worth reading about or write something that people will want to read and how Stacy sees that as an inspiration uh, to realize that every single day that we're walking on this planet, every single thing we choose to do in the process of living, we are creating stories, writing our own stories. And they're stories that live on through our family, through our friends, for the people, through the people that we impact. And they will retell them and become part of the community's DNA. And that's one way to look at that quote, that it's not just something that we do when we're writing or something that we do uh, at the end of our lives or things like that, but it's happening on a regular ongoing basis. And that makes that intentionality uh, become part of our daily walk. Uh, and then what it feels like to be in flow. This was super inspirational for me because I think a lot of us struggle with living in the future or maybe living in the past, reliving stuff we've done wrong or looking forward to co what's coming next. And there's nothing wrong with processing the past or looking forward, but by how how so much of our effort, if it's put into those things, we're actually not doing what we're supposed to be doing right now. And that's letting go of the results, releasing our expectation and still giving it everything we've got, working really hard to achieve these things that we want to, but appreciating the, the journey as we go and how when we let go of those things, we can be in the flow. The space and time literally changes. It doesn't feel like a chore. There's no victimhood. And then we can appreciate the beauty of whatever it is that's happening right now. And that's a huge gift and something I have personally been challenged by. So thank you, Stacy, again, for being so open, so transparent with what you've learned on your journey, your wisdom, your joy, and your inspiration. Cannot wait to read the rest of your book. And I highly recommend everybody pick up Black Founder. Uh, I really appreciate you, my Fearless Authenticity audience. You, uh, you listening to this is the reason why I do it. I would not do it without you. And I also could not do it without my amazing production team. Thank you to you as well. I hope you will rate, review, download, subscribe, and share this episode. It's available every place you get your podcasts, including on YouTube. And I also want you to join my community. You can follow me at JM Sparrow on IG and Twitter. You can find me on Facebook, TikTok, and YouTube at Ms. Jean Sparrow. Just drop by to say hi, share your comments, your questions, your thoughts, your suggestions. I want to hear them all. This has been Fearless Authenticity with Jean Sparrow. We'll see you again soon.